right, so here we are in front of the uh, elephants. Since this very first YouTube video was uploaded 16 years ago, the world's most popular video network has exploded to more than 2 billion users in the farthest corners of the planet, now raking in billions of dollars every year. <laughs> it's evolved a long way from cat videos to become a one-click journey to the center of the zeitgeist, pop culture, and kid culture. Amplifying some of the brightest and sometimes darkest traits in all of us. While YouTube has elevated a generation of creators and educated and entertained generations of viewers, it's fought misinformation, terrorism, racism, and violence many clicks along the way. Lately, YouTube's biggest battles are focused on eliminating COVID and vaccine misinformation and keeping the platform safe for kids and teens. On this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, we rewind to talk about where YouTube has been and fast forward to where it's going next with one of the longest tenured employees and women at Google, the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki. It's been five years since we last talked on camera. Yeah. And we have a new president. We are weathering a pandemic. The most watched video on YouTube is... Baby Shark. Baby Shark. <laughs> so a lot's changed since 2016. How do you feel about YouTube 2021 versus 2016? I feel good about it. Um, it's definitely been a while and in technology things move so quickly. So a lot of things have changed since 2016. And um, I mean, overall, I've been really pleased that we've continued to grow and grow our ecosystem of creators. Um, we've invested a lot in responsibility and um, that's been a really big focus for us. Um, and you know, we've weathered through a pandemic and a lot of hard challenges, but overall I'm feeling really good. You've been at Google for 20 plus years, going all the way back to Larry and Sergey in the garage. You've been the CEO of YouTube for seven plus years. Mm -hmm. How has your job changed in that time? Since I joined being the CEO of YouTube, I would say one of the biggest things that has changed certainly has just been maybe the um, recognition of the importance of digital video. So when I first joined, actually a lot of people would say, oh, like, why did you join? Um, um, I was running ads beforehand, and that was, uh, that's was that been the main way Google generates revenue. And so a lot of people said, like, why did you leave that and go to YouTube? But I always believed in digital video. And I believe that now we see that the world also believes. We've seen a lot of adoption of digital video and the benefits that that can have. You've championed this diversification strategy at YouTube since you started. What's working and what's not working? Well, our main way of generating revenue is from advertising. Um, but we also have really grown our subscription revenue. And um, that has been really, really important for many different reasons. So that has enabled our users to have a experience where they can have music, YouTube music and premium. We just announced the 50 million subscribers that we were really excited about. Um, but we also see other ways that our creators generate revenue. So our creators, for example, generate revenue with channel subscriptions. They may sell merchandise. Um, we also have things like um, digital goods, so like um, Super Chat, um, Super Thanks. And so we've basically diversified the number of ways that, that our ecosystem is generating revenue. The original tagline for YouTube was broadcast yourself, and that concept has exploded. You have ordinary people in the spotlight. When they grow up, they want to be an influencer. They want to be a YouTube star or a YouTube creator. What do you see as the future of the creator economy? I see a lot of possibility with the creator economy. And because I see that many people have a lot of interest and they have a lot to offer. And beforehand, they wouldn't have been able to have share, sh shared that with the world. And so there's so many people, depending upon what their talent or their interest is, whether it's a sport or cooking or gaming or hairstyles, that people have come out and really been able to share that and create a lot of jobs. Um, so we actually see like our, um, we actually saw a 35% increase in the number of creators that are generating um, six-figure income out of YouTube um, and in the last year. And so that's just an example of like how the creator economy is continuing to grow. Well, and for years, YouTube was the only company that actually paid creators. But now a lot of companies are paying creators. You know, Facebook and Instagram, Snap, TikTok. How do you see that competition playing out? Who wins? 
Well, it is a competitive landscape. And in general, I mean, competition's good. It makes everyone work harder, and that's good. Um, I mean, we look at creators and we say, they're gonna come to us if we do the best job. And creators come to us looking basically for fame and fortune. Uh, like, how can I, I have a skill or I have a talent, um, something I wanna share with the world, like, and YouTube can help that be known, can help them provide that fame, but also we can generate revenue for them. Um, and so as long as we're doing a good job of that, creators are gonna come to us if we start to fail then they're going to leave us and they're going to go to another platform. And so we just need to work really hard to make sure that we deliver that for our creators. A year ago during the Black Lives Matter protest, YouTube made big commitments to black creators sure. in particular. What's been the progress there? And how do you see YouTube, the potential for YouTube to be used as a tool for social justice? Well, so we'd made an announcement that we were going to do a $100 million um, Black Voices Fund. Um, and so we're continuing to develop content there. Um, but one of the other things, and, and I, I think there'll be a, there's been a lot of great content that's come out and we'll certainly see more. Um, but, you know, because YouTube doesn't have any gatekeepers, like you can just post and become a creator, um, you know, we've, we have seen a lot of people of different backgrounds and underrepresented backgrounds become creators and have audiences. Um, we never really measured it beforehand because we didn't have a way. And so one of the things that we've done is we've, en we've enabled creators to now tell us what backgrounds they, they affiliate with so we can have a better understanding of how they're doing on our platform. Let's talk about YouTube Shorts. It seems to be a top priority. Yeah. We all know that TikTok is on the rise. Yeah. How important are YouTube Shorts to the platform, to the company? So YouTube Shorts is very important. Um, we see that creators um, and users you know, want to watch all types of content, long form, short form. It turns out that the first video that was actually ever uploaded to YouTube, Me at the Zoo, was an 18 second video. So it was a short form video. And we have lots of short form videos and we've had it way before TikTok did. But what we have really um, been leaning into more is just enabling those to be found. Um, and then a lot of the creation tools. And so bringing a lot more mobile creation is really important for us going forward. Did you notice that viewing time was being lost to TikTok? Did you see that trend? And do you see TikTok as a sort of existential threat? I mean, we definitely see many competitors in this space. What we're just focused on are like our own metrics, like do we see our users engaging? Um, where's our opportunity? And we're always looking around and seeing what our competitors are doing. And if they're doing something that we think would be good for our users and our creators, like, you know, we're also gonna look at how we can improve our, our own economy, creator economy, and what's good for our users. I think a lot of people, you know, we talk about vaccine hesitancy and they blame social media. They say YouTube's not doing enough. One of the big things for us is to continue to work with public health experts to get their messages across. Today's your big day, are you excited? Yes. Mama is tired. Six feet apart! You have to feed your creativity. Build this tree house. You guys ready for the movie? See what we can do. At this point, YouTube has become a hub for discovery, for information, for, you know, it, it, it satisfies our, our curiosities, right? That comes with a lot of inspiration, but also with misinformation. When it comes to vaccines, vaccine hesitancy, videos that cause a public health risk, where do you want to see YouTube do better? We've taken responsibility very seriously. I've, it's been one of my top priorities. So first of all, we want to make sure that if there's information that violates our policies, we came up with 10 different policies around COVID, then if that's a violation of policies, then that's something that we'll remove. We removed over a million videos associated with COVID, but we also want to make sure that we're raising up information that we think would be, that come from trusted and authoritative sources. And we've really been able to do that. I think a lot of people, you know, we talk about vaccine hesitancy and they blame social media. They say YouTube's not doing enough, you know? How do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, first of all, we're always learning. I just, just to be fair, like we're always thinking about how can we do better? We're looking at the feedback and working with public health experts um, across the board. And, um, you know, I think one of the big things for us is to continue to work with public health experts to understand, you know, what are the ways that we can partner with them to get their messages across? 
um, and I really believe that that is something that's really changed is the the is the evolution of bringing you know, creators, musicians, experts talking about public health. We never would have seen that before the pandemic. How much do you internalize the criticism of of YouTube's content? Do you take it personally, and 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 how does that influence? the decisions that you make as CEO? I want to be doing the right thing. And I, I care about that. I care about the legacy that we leave. I care about the world that we leave to our children. I care about how media is consumed by the next generation and by, by everyone today. And so I really have put a lot of time and effort to make sure that we are acting responsibly. Um, and there's always a balance between the free speech and the um, Right, but being responsible and taking down content that we think could lead to some kind of real world harm. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, sure, I think whenever you're in a position like that, there's going to be a lot of criticism. Um, but our goal is just to continue to you know, talk to experts and evolve. And how do you make decisions in those tough moments where it's a tough call? Like how much of it is making a decision or leading by consensus and how much does it come down to you? The goal is that when we have tough decisions, they're not, we're not, um, they are like improvising in some way. Like we've made a, a concrete set of decisions beforehand and then we're looking and saying, is this something that meets our standards? Um, is it a violation or not a violation? And if it seems like there's some set of issues with the content that we have on the platform, we're gonna go back to experts and then reevaluate. Is it, should we be making changes to the, our policies? YouTube helped keep yeah. a generation of children connected, educated, entertained, distracted uh, through the pandemic. What have you learned from that experience and what do you see as the potential future of YouTube as a tool for learning, as a tool in schools? When I meet people and they find out I'm the CEO of YouTube, almost always they tell me about something they learned on YouTube or someone that they're, something their family member learned. Um, so I see that as being a very significant part of YouTube. And during the pandemic, we certainly saw that a lot more education went online and we had all the homeschooling. We had people who had to also just learn a lot of skills that they hadn't learned beforehand. But probably the biggest thing that we also learned was just, and that I really saw was a need for us to continue to work with educational um, institutions and the need for us to be able to integrate with some of the learning tools that the kids are all using because they are using YouTube and there's a lot more that we can do to really help educators have YouTube be a key part of the curriculum. My kids are on YouTube a lot and sometimes more than I want them to be. And sometimes it's super productive and they're learning something cool. And sometimes it's not productive at all. How are you innovating to make the time that kids spend on YouTube more valuable and of course safe? It's very important to me as a parent to make sure that we're giving parents options um, about how what they want their kids to see. And that's one of the reasons that pretty much as soon as I got to YouTube, we started working on YouTube Kids. Um, which is a separate app, which is important for kids in terms of how we can control the quality and we can give parents a lot more control about what kind of content is appropriate for them and their family. And, you know, there are many other things like we actually just came out with a supervised experience for tweens because tweens was one of the age groups that was actually hardest. They, they usually don't want to be on the kids app, but they're not 13 to be on the on the main app. And so the supervised experience is a, something that we recently came out with. The Wall Street Journal has been doing some in-depth reporting on Facebook. Um, you know, the report is that Facebook knew that Instagram was toxic for teen girls and didn't do anything about it. Does YouTube look at the impact it has on, on teen users, the influence it might have on, on someone's body image or self-esteem? First of all, I think it's a, it's a very important topic and um, we, we um, do have a panel of experts that we work with to be able to help us understand what are the different ways that our product could be used or what are, um, how do we um, face some of these challenging issues to make sure that we're getting the best advice. Um, and um, we certainly do see for a lot of really tough issues that YouTube can be a really valuable resource. So body positivity, mental health, we see a lot of creators actually talk about mental health um, and that that for a lot of kids, um, it's really it like destigmatizes um, and enables people to talk about what's happening and what's going on with them. The potential long-term impacts of YouTube on teens and on children 
whether it is toxic or whether it's addictive. Is that something that you wonder about? Is that something that you struggle with, not just as a CEO, but as a mom? We certainly want to make sure that we are doing what we can to be responsible with kids and in every way possible. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we actually have worked hard to give parents as many options as possible for them to decide what is important for them and their family, whether that's like limiting screen time, like limiting what is the content they actually have access to. I mean, even letting parents just say, he, these are like the 10 videos. My kid can only see these 10 videos. Um, and so that is, that is is really important for us to give the tools back to parents for them to decide what is best for them and their family. Are you concerned about looming regulation? There may be regulation that is well intended, but actually then has a really negative impact. I would like to begin by addressing the heinous attack on the United States Capitol. Like all Americans, I am outraged by the violence, lawlessness, and mayhem. How much did President Trump test YouTube, and how much did it test you as a leader? Election integrity is something that we see incredibly, is incredibly important, um, and we've leaned into in every way we possibly can. We treat all public figures and all public leaders the same as we treat any individual. And so, meaning that everybody is held to the same standards. Um, and so we definitely um, ha held President Trump as we would hold all other presidents and all other elected officials um, to the same standards that we hold our creators and anyone else on YouTube. But was that difficult for you as the CEO of the company? I mean, that's kind of, that's like a big responsibility. I mean, yeah, it, it is difficult, but I, it is very important. And we also are global. So we're dealing with leaders from all over the world. Um, and there were a number of leaders that are, and there continue to be a number of leaders that, you know, that post or that there's content that may be a violation of our policies. Um, but we do hold a consistent standard across everything that we do. YouTube was the last platform to ban Trump. And you have said his channel will be reinstated when an elevated risk of violence has subsided. How and when specifically will you make that decision? Well, we'll make that decision based on um, a number of different factors, whether that is like events in the news, um, signals we're seeing from the from the government. Um, and you know, we'll certainly continue to evaluate that based on a large number of signals that we see. And will he ultimately be reinstated? I mean, we've stated that we will reinstate him when we believe that there is no risk to public safety or no public danger. Google just removed a voting app for Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Yeah. The Russian government seems to be stepping up requests to take down content. You've talked in the past about um, your family history, your grandparents living behind the, the Iron right. Curtain, being concerned about censorship back then. And Russia is a huge YouTube audience. Yeah. How concerned are you about Russian government overreach? One of the things that were, is important to us at YouTube is the fact that we do enable so many voices and that we do enable people to express themselves and really celebrate the freedom of speech. Um, and we certainly, you know, that's, that's a core value of ours. Um, and, but when we work with governments, there are many things that we have to take in consideration, like whether it's like local laws or um, what's happening on the ground. And so there's always gonna be multiple considerations that we're gonna have to take into consideration. Navalny said that YouTube deleted a video, one of his videos. Was that at the request of the Russian government? We certainly get requests from governments, um, and and we look and consider what's you know why are we getting the request, what's actually happening on the ground, um, and based on a whole bunch of different factors, we make a decision. Um, so we don't always like, those are not always requests that make sense for us to honor, but in certain cases, you know, we will honor them um, in that country. The Biden administration seems to be targeting big tech. We've seen Mark Zuckerberg, we've seen Jack Dorsey now testify before Congress multiple times. And I've heard it said that YouTube is getting a pass. Do you think you should be up there testifying? Well, I think we do get a lot of scrutiny. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of scrutiny. Um, and because YouTube is part of Google, um, Sendar has testified a number of different times and answered many different questions on YouTube. So I do believe there's a certain amount of scrutiny. And you know, if, if 
I were ever asked to testify, I certainly would go and testify as well. You're one of the most senior women at Google, if not the most senior woman at Google. Google has faced a lot of scrutiny for how it treats women in recent years. How much progress do you think Google has made in hiring and promoting women across the company? And how much progress do you think still needs to be made? I see a really big effort across technology as a whole to be able to be more inclusive. And I think that is really positive. I've been a big supporter of it since the very beginning. Um, and I mean, I think at Google, there are many efforts and there's a lot of, um, a lot of work um, that has been done. And I'm sure there's a lot more for us to continue to do. And if you just look at the stats, you can see there are not enough women. We need more women. Um, in technology, and I think we have made a lot of progress, but it's still hard. It's hard to be, uh, it's harder to be a woman in technology. It's harder to be a minority of any kind. Um, and so I think there's still a lot of work for us to do. When we last spoke five years ago, um, you know, I asked you about being a mom, you have five kids, and you said something that really stuck with me. You said being a mom makes me a better leader. I prioritize better. I see something growing fast and I run towards that. If something's growing closely, I'm like, I don't have time for that. How has that management strategy played out for you? I think it's played out really well. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been, I mean, prioritization is everything when you look at it because we have a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of moving pieces, very dynamic environment. So if you can prioritize and say, these are like the most important things to do, then you know, you're gonna get there faster. Larry and Sergey have now left. How long do you plan to keep running YouTube? How long do you plan to stay at Google? As long as I have a mission that I believe in and that I and things that I'm excited about getting done. So I have a lot of ways that I see that YouTube can continue to grow. I have a lot of products and ideas and things that aren't yet released and things that we don't, aren't yet doing. Um, and I'm excited about getting those done. So I think if there comes a time where I no longer have a list of, of projects or I feel like I don't have that much more to add, then it'll be probably time to do something else. Would you throw your hat into the ring to be Alphabet's next CEO? Or if the board asked you, would you step up and do that? Well, I think Sundar's doing a great job. <laughs> very, I'm very um, pleased. I think he's doing, I mean, it's a very challenging job. There's a lot of different constituents and a lot of product, a lot of different issues. Um, and I mean, I'll just say I, I'll always do whatever um, would be wherever I could be most helpful to the company. Do you still talk much to Larry and Sergey? I do still see them socially, though, not 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 work wise. Do you ever talk about work? I mean, sometimes maybe casually, but our business is very complex right now, um, and there's a lot of things that are happening, and so it's hard for. Um, I mean, people may have different opinions, but um, to really to to really engage, it's a long conversation. What do you want your legacy to be? I am proud of the way that we've been able to enable people to have a, um, a, a channel, to have an audience. Like I just met with a number of three, three creators and like, like YouTube really was able to let them shine and create audiences in a business and employ people that otherwise never would have happened. And so that's certainly one, um, continuing to grow that. I'd say second, it's been really important to me too to see a lot more women in technology. Um, that has been just a personal goal of mine is to like be a role model and try to support women. And I feel very fortunate to be, have gotten to where I have and I know it was due to like many different factors. Um, and I wanna support the next generation of women and make, see technology as like an open place where anyone can come and be successful. Uh, and then probably lastly, continue to grow what we're doing with education. Susan Wojcicki, CEO of YouTube. Really great Thank to you. have you on Thank the show you so today. much for having me.